Hi, Geshema. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. I can't hear you guys. Hello. For some reason. Okay, now, now I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, so whenever you're ready, let me see if everyone is a strong small group. Maybe I'll wait a minute or two. What time is it where you are now? Is it already eight? Because I got different yes. times. Yes. Is it exactly eight? Because like two different mm. devices. One is two minutes to to eight, and the other one is yeah, two minutes, two minutes after. Two minutes. Pardon? two minutes. Two minutes to eight. Two minutes to eight. Okay, great. Wow, that's Darmsala. <laughs> I'm seeing a picture of Darmsala. Don't show me a picture of Darmsala. I'll miss it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Oh. I miss it. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm not kidding about missing it. But I'm kidding about don't show me a picture. So that's what I meant. <laughs> Where I live looks like Dharmasala, actually. Where you live? Where do you live? In Israel, a lot. Ah, OK. Ah, lovely. It's, uh, it's between two mountains. It's All right. <laughs> wow. Beautiful. And at, at night, the lights like that. Uh -huh. so yes. From the from Sibor, I used to see the lights. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I don't know why I'm coming on like this because I'm talking. I'm big. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, so is it meant to start? Yes, I think we can uh, start. Can okay, great. Hello right. everyone, hello Geshema, thank you everyone for joining. Um, again, I'm uh, just reminding uh, everyone uh, that uh, all the activity uh, of Dharma Friends of Israel and the teachings is done by the teacher uh, voluntary and we can support uh, by uh, donation. Uh, I can you speak louder, please? I posted the link. Now we're here in the chat. Uh, uh, so thank you, Geshema. Uh, and uh, we can uh, start. Okay, should we start? Great. All right, as always, let's start with some breathing meditation followed by visualization, then setting the motivation and doing some prayers. Okay. So just focus on your breath to settle the mind and prepare it for this session.
And now in the space in front of you, visualize the Buddha, whose body is made of blissful, transparent light. Wears the saffron robes of a monk and sits in a full lotus position. Seated on an open lotus, a sun disk and a moon disk. His right hand in the earth touching gesture and his left hand resting in his lap holding a begging bowl. Surrounding the Buddha are the great Indian masters such as Nagarjuna, Sangha, Bhava Viveka, Buddha Palita, but most importantly, Chandakirti. And surrounding you and great beings in the space in front of you are all sentient beings. And then generate the thought for the welfare of all these endless sentient beings. For their benefit, may I reach the same state of full enlightenment that the Buddha has reached and so many other great masters have reached as well. May this session become a cause for me to attain that state of enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings. And with this motivation, let's recite the prayers together. First, Bodhicitta, yeah, I'm sorry, Refuge in Bodhicitta, yeah, great. Okay, so to really think of the meaning of the words while we recite this. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, by practicing generosity, and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits, of practicing generosity, and so forth, 
May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the accumulation of merits of practicing generosity and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. And thereafter, the four measurables. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings never be separated from happiness that is free from suffering. And may all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment for friends and hatred for enemies. Okay. Right. So. Last time, well, it's been two classes now that we just a sec. It's been two classes now that we've done, we went through the text and we've finished the first and the second verse. Well, the title, we talked about the title, we talked about the praise or the homage by the translators, and then we started the first chapter of the actual text. And with the actual text, there are three and a half verses. The first three and a half verses, um, within, with these three, three and a half, first three and a half verses, Chandakirti pays homage. Here it's done by way of bowing, though bowing down doesn't, doesn't mean the physical bowing down is mainly a mental kind of paying homage, paying respect. And what does Chandrakirti pay respect to? To great compassion. So quite different to many other texts which pay homage to a person, pay homage to, um, well, state of enlightenment, etc. Instead, Chandrakirti pays homage to what's called great compassion. Um, and then when you have these three now verses, of those, the first two verses pay homage to great compassion in general. And then the next one and a half verses, they pay homage to compassion by way of describing or paying homage to the three categories of compassion, which we briefly talked about last time, but uh, I'll need a little, you'll need more explanation. I'll need to go more into details on that. And in verse number one, just briefly, um, basically, as you know, Buddhism has two goals, two goals, which are liberation, as well as enlightenment. But to be more, to be more general, basically, Buddhism is all about realizing and living the truth. In other words, to exist in harmony with the way phenomena really exist. That's the goal of Buddhism to exist, to live in accordance with the way phenomena exist. And there are two goals which exactly lead to that state. There's liberation and there's enlightenment. Liberation preceding enlightenment. Whereas we as ordinary beings, we live in accordance with ignorance, with accordance to the, in accordance to the misapprehension of reality. And so with these two goals, with this general goal to live in accordance with the truth, but also the, the goal of liberation and enlightenment, we talk about four great beings who are either on the way towards reaching those goals or have already reached them. And they're called four Aryas, four Arya beings. With Arya referring to a being who has directly experienced reality having directly experienced how phenomena really exist. And that means either you've already reached your goal of liberation or enlightenment, or you're very close to 
in, in relation to everyone, ordinary beings, you relatively closely have, have reached a state where you're close to liberation or enlightenment. And those great four great areas, they can be divided into the two vehicles, the two areas from the point of view of the Hinayana or the fundamental vehicle, or is it, as, it was, as it's also called the Pali tradition. So those are Hira Aryas, Shravaka Aryas. That's one of the two Aryas. And the other one is Solitary Realizer Aryas or um, Pratikya Buddha Aryas. So those two Aryas belong to the category of the fundamental vehicle. And then you have two Aryas of the universal vehicle the Mahayana or the Sanskrit tradition, different ways to describe it. And those two are Bodhisattva Aryas and Buddhas. And the first verse is basically saying those four Aryas, the root cause of those is great compassion. With, with, uh, with respect to uh, Shravakas and solitary realizes those two Hinayana Aryas, well, they couldn't exist if it, were, if it wasn't for the Buddha teaching them the means or the methods to attaining liberation. And a Buddha couldn't exist if the Buddha hadn't been a Bodhisattva before. And a Bodhisattva couldn't exist if he didn't have, if he or she didn't have great compassion. So therefore, great compassion is the root of Arya Shravakas, Arya Solitary Realizers, Arya Bodhisattvas, Arya Buddhas. So great compassion, therefore. That's what the first verse teaches us. The second verse is saying great compassion. This great compassion is extremely important. It's important in the beginning, it's important in the middle, and it's important at the end. In the beginning means when starting out, working towards enlightenment, working, and this being the Mayana tradition, the goal is not just liberation, it is full enlightenment. The focus is on enlightenment for the welfare of all sentient beings. That's what we started this lesson with. That's the motivation that should pervade all our practices. And so that being the case, great compassion is important when we start off with our practice. It's important while we're practicing and, and moving towards enlightenment, and it's important at the end. And the example that is given the analogy, the analogy that is given for that is if we want to enjoy a fruit in our own garden, there are three steps we have to go through. First, we need to plant a seed. Then we need water to, to water the growing tree. And eventually we need to harvest the fruit to be able to enjoy this fruit. Okay, that's the analogy given. If you want to enjoy this fruit in your own garden, need to set plant a seed, you need to water the growing tree, and you need to harvest the fruit. And likewise, here it said that enjoying the fruit is like engaging in the enlightened activities of a Buddha. And the seed that is planted is initially great compassion. So when you newly basically awaken your Buddha nature, when you newly awaken your Buddha nature, you generate great compassion. That's when you really start out moving towards enlightenment. It's, you haven't entered the path yet, but you're actually getting closer to enlightenment, moving closer towards that state because you are moved away from the self-cherishing attitude and instead you're now cherishing other sentient beings. So therefore, that seed here, Planting the seed, as described in verse number two, is the analogy for initially generating great compassion. The next step is watering the growing tree. So here, great compassion is like the water that you continuously, so great compassion, you need to continuously strengthen your great compassion, even after you generated bodhicitta, that is the wish to become enlightened for the welfare of all sentient beings. And that great compassion enables you to move through the different stages and the different grounds of the Bodhisattva path. All right, so that's in the middle. And then harvesting the fruit, that is like compassion in the continuum of the Buddha. So if you harvest the fruit without which you wouldn't be able to eat and enjoy the fruit, well, that's 
that's the analogy for the great compassion in the continuum of a Buddha that is the driving force between the Buddha's enlightened activities. All right, so that's described in verse number two. In verse number three, um, in verse number three, Chantakirti starts discussing the three, or he discusses the three categories of enlightenment. No, sorry, the three categories of great compassion, the three types of great compassion. So as I mentioned last time, compassion doesn't, great compassion doesn't just refer to ordinary compassion. Ordinary compassion um, is a type of mind. Yes, surely there's a feeling of closeness towards a particular sentient beings or maybe a group of sentient beings. Um, and then there's the wish focusing on those sentient beings for them to be free from suffering. That is ordinary um, compassion. I guess you can define it that way. Great compassion has its basis in that ordinary compassion, but first of all, it focuses on all sentient beings indiscriminately. So the wish for sentient beings to be free from suffering is directed, it's, it's, it's directed towards each and any sentient beings without any discrimination, even though we don't know all sentient beings, but there's that sense no matter who there is, whichever sentient being there is, so whoever there is, may they be free from suffering. But here also suffering is not the ordinary type. It does not refer to the ordinary type of suffering that we ordinarily uh, describe to be suffering. No, it refers to the three types of suffering. It refers to our limitations in general that keep us within samsara. And if you want to take it further, that keeps us from being enlightened. But so basically we say it's the three types of suffering that we wish all sentient beings to be free from, motivated by closeness. There's a feeling of closeness, of loving affection towards all sentient beings. And then, as I also discussed last time, that kind of great compassion, well, we could argue also Shravakas and, and particular Buddhas, they have that kind of compassion. Why not? There's no reason they wouldn't have that compassion. So then there's this particular view where great compassion doesn't just refer to that wish, but also to the wish, may I be able to fulfill this wish of mine, may, that all sentient beings may be free from the three types of suffering. So not only to wish for that in general, but that I may, may be able to, to work towards that. So describing great compassion in that way. And as I said last time, great compassion is always that. It's always that type of mind. But still we, we describe or we distinguish between great compassion that focuses or that observes only sentient beings, great compassion that observes dharmas, and great compassion that observes that which is unobservable, non-observable, which refers to emptiness or selflessness. So we distinguish between those three, which basically means the following. Compassion that only focuses, that only observes sentient beings the first time is a type of great compassion that while it is operating, there is no other type of mind that for instance, realizes the impermanence of sentient beings or the selflessness of sentient beings. There's only that mind of great compassion. So therefore it said that is great compassion that observes only sentient beings. But then there's another type of great compassion. Again, the same type of great compassion as in the first case, but while it's operating, there is another type of mind that for instance, realizes the impermanence of sentient beings. Nothing more than that, just the impermanence of sentient beings. That is called compassion that observes dharmas. Dharmas as the impermanence of all the different sentient beings. Again, just being aware while you have that one mind, that one awareness, which with it's a loving attitude that wishes for all sentient beings to be free from the three types of suffering that wishes even more so, may I be able to bring this about? While that is actively in my mind, that's active in my mental continuum, at the same time, there's another awareness that knows all these sentient beings are changing, they're impermanent. 
So those two minds can operate together. One realizes the impermanence of sentient beings and the other one wishes for them to be free from all types of suffering or wishes for myself to be able to bring this about. Okay, that's great compassion, observing dharmas. And then the third type is great compassion that again, it's great compassion as before, focusing on all sentient beings, wishing them to be free from suffering, wishing oneself to be able to bring this about, that is accompanied by a mind which does not merely realize the, the, the impermanence. No, well, it doesn't need to, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it, it, it basically, well, it can realize with a third mind, but that's not important here. It's basically, it's accompanied by a mind that realizes the selflessness of all phenomena. It realizes that phenomena don't exist. So, sorry, the selflessness of all sentient beings. So while great compassion is present, while it's operating, there's another mind that realizes the selflessness, the emptiness of all sentient beings. So it's more than realizing the impermanence, as in the case of compassion that observes dharmas. Here it is great compassion that observes emptiness or the non-observable. The non-observable, just saying emptiness is something that cannot be observed with an ordinary mind. So that's why it's said, it's said it's the unobservable, non-observable with an ordinary mind. Okay, so those are the three types. And we basically talk about compassion here that observes only sentient beings that is operating on its own. All right, and that is described in verse number Three. Verse number three discusses or describes compassion, compassion that merely observes, that merely focuses on sentient beings. And it describes this, this type of compassion, but actually it describes this great compassion, it, not so much saying this is what it is, that's implied, but rather it talks about the causes, it, it, it talks about the way we can develop great compassion. How do we develop great compassion? And that's described in those two verses. So the first two lines, what they describe is actually the causes that are responsible for sentient beings to wander within cyclic existence. The first two, two lines. Okay, let me just go to the text. Self. Yeah, it says first with the thought I am, they cling to a self. Oh, there is great. First with the thought I am, they cling to a self. Then with the thought mine, they become attached to things. Those are the first two lines um, of the third verse. And what do they describe? They describe the causes that are responsible for sentient beings to wander in cyclic existence. And I'll talk about this now, give, it, give you more of a description. We talked about it last time briefly, but I'll um, go into more details on this. And then the last two lines, like buckets on a water wheel, they turn without control, they bow to the compassion that cares for such sentient beings. So really the third line, mainly the fourth line is just saying, I bow to it, I pay my respect to it. The fourth line, the third line is saying, is talking about how sentient beings wander in samsara and experience suffering. All right. Now, as I said, the first two lines talk about the three, three causes. It mentions three causes with the former giving rise to the latter. So the first one is the misapprehension of the I. First with the thought I am. So it doesn't just mean an ordinary thought, I am the conventional I. Oh, no, no, it's very specific here. It talks about the misapprehension of the I, which is a mind that perceives the I, perceives the self to be inherently existent. That's the first cause. That leads to a misapprehension of the I, of mine, sorry. This leads to a misapprehension of what is mine. So it perceives the I as the owner, and it perceives that to exist inherently, but also perceives specifically mind and body to exist inherently. So you have the misapprehension of the I and the misapprehension of mind. 
The misapprehension of the eye refers to, and that's explained later on as part of the sixth chapter of this text. The misapprehension of the eye refers to the, the ignorance, to, the, to a misapprehension, perceiving the, the eye to exist in and of itself inherently. The misapprehension of the ma of mind refers to a misapprehension, a, a wrong kind of mind, a wrong type of consciousness that is mistaken. Why? Because it perceives not just the I itself, but also that which is mind, mind, body and mind. So the aggregates, body and mind, to exist inherently. That is the second cause. And the last is attachment that arises from these two misapprehensions, attachment to I and attachment to mine. All right, so he only mentions three causes here. The first two causes, actually, the misapprehension of the I and the misapprehension of mine, with the misapprehension of mine, this wrong view with regard to mine, as I said earlier, does not just refer, does not just refer to apprehending mind and body to exist inherently, but to also apprehend the I, that's the owner, that's considered to be the owner of mind and body to exist inherently. So those two minds, misapprehension of the I, misapprehension of mind, of mine, of, of that which is mine, M-I-N-E, mine, they actually give rise to something called the inappropriate or exaggerating attitude which, what does it do? It exaggerates the importance of the I and the importance of that which is mine. So the importance of I and mine, my body, my mind, the importance of the I. And that then gives rise to the attachment to I, to mind and body. And the attachment to our mind, body and mind in turn, that gives rise to what's called self-cherishing or the self-centered attitude which based on attachment to I and mine, considers my own happiness to be more important than the happiness of others. All right, so this is not all mentioned here, but I thought it was important to not just mention those three here, but to also mention as one of the causes uh, towards, well, and one of the causes why we wander in cyclic existence, well, it's the misapprehension of the I, the misapprehension of mine, then exaggerating the importance of the I, exaggerating the importance of my body, my mind, leading to attachment, leading to attachment, holding on to, having exaggerated, and the attachment itself also exaggerates the importance of I and mine importance of body and mind, importance of the eye itself. Um, but more specifically, it holds on to me, on, on to, it holds on to I, it holds on to my mind, my body. So therefore, the attachment, that's the third type explicitly mentioned here. So that type of attachment in turn gives then rise to what's called self-cherishing. So out of this attachment towards my considering my happiness, my well-being, that is more important than that of others. And this type of mind oftentimes operates on a subconscious level, which is why we are not always aware of it, but it still controls most of our actions. Most of our actions, positive or negative, are motivated by that. There may be rare occasions, on rare occasions, that we see someone suffer that we don't know, and their well-being does not in any way have anything to do with my own well-being. So my children, my family, their well-being, I have a sense that that affects my own well-being. It's out of attachment towards them that I help them. But I may be a total stranger in whose well-being I don't see any connection to myself, and I still get out of my way and just help them. Those would be activities where this mind of self-cherishing is not as active as usual, as usually. But most of our actions, and I, I would also say that a lot of the times it's subconscious. We're not aware of this driving force of our self-centeredness. But anyway, Chandakirti only mentions of those five that I mentioned. So misapprehension of the I, misapprehension of mind, attachment to I and mind, those three that are explicitly mentioned in the, in the verses, well, what I, what I also included 
is the exaggerating attitude that I just talked about, as well as self-centeredness. Okay, so I'll say it one more time. The basic misapprehension, perceiving an inherently existent I, first type of mind, then perceiving an inherently existent I plus that which is mine, mind and body, those two minds, they also give rise to an exaggerating attitude, a type of mind that exaggerates the importance of the I and the importance of what's my body, my mind, which then leads to attachment to I and mind. And attachment to I and mind leads to the self-cherishing or the self-centered attitude. The sense that my happiness is more important. The thought, my, my happiness is more important than that of others. And acting accordingly. All right. So that is described in verse number three. But the first two lines are verse number three. All right. So actually, this is a means to understanding to understanding the causes that are responsible for sentient beings' existence in samsara. But of course, before we, before the thought of sentient beings experiencing those three types, those five times that I also mentioned just now, before we can actually reflect on them and use that as a way to generate great compassion, we need to, of course, um, reflect this on our own example, to understand that my life is basically controlled by those two types of minds. There's the misapprehension of the I, the misapprehension of mind, body, and mind, my body and mind, that which is mine. And then the then the, the, the exaggerated attitude. Then there's attachment to I and mind, and that leads to self-cherishing. And of course, then all the other afflictions, karma, and so forth. And how much do I suffer because of that? All my problems don't come from the outside. No, they all come from these misapprehensions, from these basic wrong views that lead to all my other problems. But then to think, just as I experience those, all the sentient beings do too. So other sentient beings, I'm not talking about highly, I mean, well, our hearts, et cetera. Oh, right. They no, no longer experience those types of sufferings but we're talking about here in general ordinary sentient beings so all of them most all of them all, all ordinary sentient beings the reason they have so many problems so much suffering is that so to really spend some time on that and this would be also uh next week's homework if you like of course again to work with great compassion we haven't completed that part yet so Great compassion is still our main focus. But to also take some time as you walk around, look around, look at sentient beings. And just remind yourself, they experience this basic misapprehension. And then uncontrollably, that then gives rise to all the other states of mind. And they have no control. And so we may sometimes envy another person. Their life seems so perfect. Their life seems wonderful. But because of those states of mind, their lives are far from wonderful, far from perfect. No way, no way can they experience true happiness. No matter how rich they are, no matter how happy their family is, no matter how, there may be a, a certain degree of well-being, but in the end, they will all experience problems and difficulties. So to reflect upon that, take some time to reflect on these different causes. And we can take it further from there to just to also become aware that because of these misapprehension, therefore there's birth. We are incontrollably, without any choice, we are born somewhere. And then that leads to our present mind and body that we have right now, which be other causes for the other su suffering, sufferings of sickness, old age, and death. So again, to first think of it, with regard to our own, our own situation. And to also think no matter how rich we are, one day we will lose everything we work so hard for. So if it's not towards, well, next, next week, next year or whenever, well, definitely at the time when we die. No matter how high our status, 
how great our reputation, one day we'll all have to give it up. When we grow old, possibly, when people forget, forget about us, or at least, well, definitely at the latest, when we die. So to really think about this, how no matter how famous you can get, and even if, even if you're so famous that people remember your name and you make it into the history books, well, at that time, you're no longer that person. So considering future lives, well, if there are future lives, you, you continue as a different person and you don't even know you were that person whose name is now found in a, in a history book. Okay, So you basically lose that. And whichever relationships you have with your children, your husband, your best friends, it'll all end at the time of death. So samsara is really cruel. Samsara is cruel. Cruel in the sense that we experience those basic sufferings, leaving aside all the other ones. So if we become aware how we suffer in that way, well, other sentient beings do too. Other sentient beings do too. So this is what we should reflect on. This is we should, we already did that last time to a certain degree, but of course I'll include something more this time, but that should definitely be part of your consideration. And actually doing it for one week, of course it's not enough, we should do it again and again and again. So this is the opportunity, we'll do it at the end of the session, but also as part of your uh, next week's homework, call it what you like, kind of in between work, that wherever you are, whatever you do, we can we can multitask, it's no problem. So usually we daydream, but instead of daydreaming to make time, again, I want to do it with 20 times. And if that you can do 20, if you can do more, excellent. If you can't do it, it's still great, but I want to keep that because I feel 20, that's a good way of dividing it throughout the day. To just remind yourself, especially when you meet other people, when you see them on the street, when you sit in a, um, in, a, in, a, in a traffic jam, for instance, wherever you are, and even if you're on your own, there are people around you wherever you live, well, animals, of course, anyway, insects, etc., but human beings as well, same situation as just described. All right. But now I'd like to go to the, the next line, line number three, um, of verse number three. So previously I said it was the last two lines, but no, I'm mistaken. It's the this that line, yeah. Like buckets on a water wheel, sentient beings turn without control. So the idea here with the bucket and the water wheel, again, we have to apply this to ourselves first. And then of course, apply it to sentient beings. So here explicitly, it talks about other sentient beings. And so what is this bucket on a water wheel? Um, I did a little bit of research on that. Um, so it's talking about a well, when you have a well. And, oh yeah, there is. So I found this picture. There you have it. There's the water wheel. You see the water wheel, this wheel to the side, to the right of it. And there's the bucket. And that is a traditional well. well like buckets on the water. Oh, yeah, great. Yeah, there you have it. Good cheer. Very good. Thank you. They turn without control. Okay, so here you have this example. That's the analogy that describes how we wander in samsara and how we suffer. So there's six reasons, six um, ways in which this analogy is used and a beautiful way to take that as the example and then to meditate on uh, suffering, suffering of ourselves. But here, in order to generate great compassion for sentient beings, of course, the focus is on other sentient beings, understanding that they go through that because I go through it myself and we're all stuck in the same situation. There's some differences, but yeah, the basics, the basic misapprehensions are the same. Now, here the translation talks about buckets. Now, I've, like I said, I did a little bit of research, like where did, in India, like with this, like this Persian wheel, and there are different versions of this, um, where on the water wheel you have already um, buckets, and the wheel goes within, goes inside the, the 
um, the water and brings up those filled vessels. But I don't think they're talking about this. I think it's definitely a, a bucket on a rope, which will become clear here in those examples. I've seen other versions They've also existed in India, where you had not just one rope with one bucket, but a rope with many different buckets. So they were just one after the other. And as you pull them up, all these different buckets are full. So using the plural here, it could refer to not just having one bucket, but many. But it could also be because we talk about sentient beings and each person is their own bucket, basically. All right. And I prefer the idea of just being one bucket because there's one wheel and the wheel refers also to something specific with regard to one sentient being. So each sentient being has its own water wheel and its own, well, bucket in that sense. What is a little bit difficult about these six ways to talk about this is that the examples, what does it say? There are buckets that hang on the, okay. There are buckets there hang on the wheel where the water comes in and pours from bucket to, yeah, okay, great. Yes, so Varda put a comment here. Yes, you could read that, um, totally right. Um, but the point is, my, the point I'm trying to make is that here you have the example of the, the bucket, you have the example of the water wheel in the bucket, and there's six ways in which we can use the example to become aware of sentient beings predicament of wandering and suffering in cyclic existence. And the example, sometimes the bucket is used for, for sentient beings and the next example is used for something else. So just bear with me. It's, it's each, each one is an entity of using the example slightly differently. Each one of those six examples, but very potent. So if you look at Lamanson Kappa's uh, commentary, you have those um, described there in Lamanson Kappa's text. Uh, and I'll explain them to you again. I'll explain them and then hopefully um, what Lama Tsongkhapa says becomes clearer. He doesn't clearly talk so much about uh, the analogy, but rather he talks more about what the, the analogy refers to. So I'll mention both the analogy and that which it refers to. Now, one, one comment I'd like to make before I talk about these six ways to reflect upon the bucket and the water wheel. When you hear the word wonder in samsara or wandering sentient beings, wandering beings or migratory beings, there are certain words that are a little awkward in English. We don't use those words, wandering sentient beings. Like who talks about wandering beings or migratory beings? It's something more like refugees um, migrating to a different place for instance but actually what it means it, it's the translation of a tibetan word which is droa droa actually means to go but it can also mean to aimlessly walk here and there you can refer to that and here it's talking about sentient beings they're like walking not literally walking but moving through life experiencing all types of situations that they don't necessarily wish for, so they're aimlessly wandering here and there, but even on a larger scale, a more important scale, they, like, other people wander from country to country without any aim, without any goal, so likewise here we wander through cyclic existence, we're reborn, we're thrown into different existences from one life to the next, so this, it's got this connotation, this word doa, if it is used for sentient beings, if it's used like a noun, it's used for sentient beings, but it can also be used for the activity of aimlessly wandering. So in English, it doesn't always come across that way, but oftentimes when you hear, when you see the word migratory beings, that's actually a translation of the word draw, as used as a noun and referring to these aimlessly wandering sentient beings. All right. so. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of give you a sense why that word, word pops up all the time, migratory beings, migrating, wandering, etc. Well, the reason is that there's a specific term. Now, returning to this water wheel. So if you remember, there's this water wheel, there's a rope attached, or there's a bucket that is attached to the water wheel by a rope. 
in the well what i the the the, the, the picture that you saw earlier it's a sh chain it was a chain but i guess traditionally in india it's it's a um it's a it's a rope so now with regard to the analogies here so the first analogy is just as a bucket is tied by a rope to a water wheel in the case of the here the well so just as the the bucket is tied by a rope to the water wheel likewise sentient beings are bound oh it's not in the text yeah so it's this one line contains those now following six analogies or six ways to interpret this so just as the bucket is tied by a rope to the water wheel likewise sentient beings are bound to cyclic existence by karma and afflictions okay so here in this sentence sentient beings are like the bucket they're likened to a bucket karma and afflictions are likened to the rope and cyclic existence is likened to the water wheel. Okay, so just as a bucket, just as sentient beings, are, is tied by a rope, by karma and afflictions, to a water wheel, to, to cyclic existence. All right, so just as a bucket is tied, or just as the bucket is tied by a rope to the water wheel, likewise sentient beings are bound to cyclic existence by karma and afflictions. That's the first one. So to think about this, we are, we are bound by karma and afflictions. So if you think about this, what your life looks like, how much control is there? So I'm not just going through them, so, oh, understand, you know, done that, gone. No, to reflect on that. To reflect on how we are under the control of karma and afflictions. That's the first part. The second, the second example is just as the water wheel moves through the force of the person rotating the wheel. Okay, so now there's imagine there's a person rotating the wheel. Okay, just as the water wheel moves through the force of the person rotating the wheel without the wheel being able to insert any control there's no control it's the person kind of moving the wheel likewise sentient beings are controlled by their mind okay so it's a little different to the first one here sentient beings are like the water wheel not like the bucket and sentient beings consciousness the unruly mind of sentient beings that is like the person rotating the water wheel so in the first analogy, it's karma and afflictions, very specific. That's what we're tied by. But basically it's our unruly mind. In the sec second analogy, we have this unruly mind and that's what controls us. And whatever we wish for certain things, but we can't control our mind and keep generate, keep producing that which causes us suffering. Then number three says, well, just as one turn of the water wheel so one turn if you turn the water wheel that is immediately followed by another turn and another turn so think these wells were in the center of a village and they were used continuously all day all day again and again okay maybe the person was changing rotating the the water wheel but there was just no end continuous rotation so likewise in samsara one rebirth is followed by the next is followed by the next is followed by the next so here, continuous samsaric rebirth, that is likened to the continuous turning of the water wheel. All right, that's number three. Okay, so besides the fact that we have, we are tied by karma and afflictions and we're controlled by our mind, well, due to that and due to the three causes described earlier on, we again and again experience samsaric having samsaric experiences in particular we're reborn over and over again and even if you have a hard time to think of rebirth well every day leads to challenges leads to problems every day is like a rebirth if you like and one day needs to the next and needs to the less there's just no there's no break basically right okay then number four just like as the bucket falls to the bottom of the well with great ease, it easy, easily falls to the bottom of the, 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 the well or where the water is, but is raised only with much exertion. So to raise it, it takes 
exertion. It's not easy. Likewise, sentient beings easily take bath in the lower realms, but are born in the higher realms only through much effort. Okay, so if you consider the possibility of future lives, well, it's very easy to be reborn in lower states in, in existence of suffering. It's much harder to create the causes to be reborn in happy states and therefore one is much easier than the other and that's true for our daily life it's so much easier to get angry to get, be envious to have attachment to have all these afflictions in 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 comparison to generating the antidotes the antidotes to these afflictive states of mind which then leads to a peaceful kind of mind to a happy a content state of mind Okay, so like a bucket, easily falls to the bottom. It's hard to pull it up. Likewise, it's easy to engage in afflictive actions, create the causes for suffering experience. It's so much harder to create the causes for happy experiences. All right, number five. Just as when the water wheel rotates quickly, okay? It rotates quickly if it's used all the time. And then if that's the case, it's difficult to tell when one rotation is complete when one rotation is finished, and when another one starts. Likewise, when sentient beings wander in cyclic existence, it is difficult to know which is first, afflictions, karmic actions, or the effects of afflictions and karmic actions. So you can think of the 12 links of dependent arising, or just like which one is an effect, which one is a cause, which one, what is afflictive, what is karmic, very difficult to know, okay? Because every day, we create new causes, we experience results from the past, and it's hard to really differentiate between them. And number six, when the bucket is lowered into the well and pulled up again, it swings usually uncontrollably and it gets battered, it gets indented, there are dents in it, and it gets scratched at the wall. So it gets basically damaged in that process. It, it, yeah, it, it undergoes a lot of, uh, uh, well, battering and, and scratching and so forth. In the same way, likewise, as sentient beings, as we, as sentient beings, are we born in the higher and lower realms of suffering, they constantly undergo the three types of suffering. So the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change. So it's not just that we're reborn um, again and again, which here specifically it talks about rebirth here, but we have all these problems at the same time. And we already mentioned them before. Okay, now these are the six examples, all right? So first, it talks about the fact we're tied by karma and afflictions. Number two, well, because we're controlled by our mind in general, which leads to continuous samsaric experiences, samsaric rebirth or samsaric experience, experiences. And it's very easy to fall into negative states, experience negative states, it's much harder to experience positive states. And it's very difficult to differentiate what is now an affliction, what is a karmic cause, what is a karmic result, to really differentiate with regard to the different states of mind or the different experiences. And then just when the bucket is, uh, and, and, and at the end, um, well, while we, we live within samsara, we're constantly battered, we're constantly scratched, we're constantly experiencing all these problems, all these difficulties. And although we're tired of it, we keep experiencing them because we keep creating them. So, and that is true, not just for us, it's true for all sentient beings, for all sentient beings, so much suffering. It may like all look very beautiful and styled at the outside, but at the inside, insecurities, worries, anxiety, and then of course, sickness, aging, death, anyway, right? So to really reflect on that, to give it some time to think about this, to reflect on that by way of those six examples. Uh, that is definitely a very beautiful way to, yeah, well, reflect upon how sentient beings suffer. Okay. Now, I've said a lot, I've given you a lot of information, but well, that's why we studied this text. It contains a lot of information. Um, if you've made notes, you've got it in front of you. It is, it is hard, it's a lot of information, but trust me, you hear it once, you hear it twice, and it, it becomes relatively easy. 
Okay, so I talked about, just to sum it up before I continue, I want to make sure I don't um, always have time to meditate, but I spoke about the first verse, just saying that compassion is the root of everything, great compassion. The second verse, great compassion is important at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. But then more specifically, how do we generate compassion? Well, by understanding sentient beings are caught in this existence that we are caught in us ourselves. So we reflect upon it ourselves first, but the focus is on others. So the fact that there's this basic misapprehension of reality with regard to the I and with regard to that which is mine, body and mind, which leads to attachment to I and mine. And of course, in the process, the exaggerating attitude, self-cherishing, and then all the other afflictive emotions, jealousy, envy, arrogance, greed, anger, hate, resentment, all these terrible, terrible, terrible states of mind that so much harm sentient beings. And of course, then sentient beings engaging in all these negative actions. So those are the causes. And because of those causes, they're tied to, like a bucket is tied by rope to the water wheel, in the same way sentient beings are tied to cyclic existence by karma and afflictions. They're tied to this existence we're in right now. In the same way, they're controlled. They're, they're basically controlled just as the water wheel is, is rotated by a person. Um, we are basically controlled by our own mind. So what we wish is happiness, but our mind keeps creating the causes for suffering. What we wish is peace of mind, lasting happiness. What our mind creates is continuous change, continuous new situation. One situation, we love it, but it's already changing. And even the wonderful experiences, they never last. And we're continuously thrown into states that we don't like. And just as the water will continuously, immediately one follows after the other, well, continuously we're born in cyclic existence, continuously from day to day we experience problems. And just as the bucket easily falls to the bottom, but it's difficult to raise it, well, it's easy to engage in negative and harmful actions. It's so much harder to engage in positive actions and to experience the, 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 the results of those actions. And just as when the water wheel rotates quickly, it's difficult to tell when does one round complete, when is one round complete, when does a new round start? Well, likewise, with regard to these rounds of like causes giving rise to certain results, like what is an afflictive emotion that causes another problem? What is a karmic actions? What is a result of that? Very difficult to tell. And just when the bucket is lowered into the well, it's battered, it's, it's battered, it's dented, it, it's, it's scratched, etc. Well, we are already in a state where we're very vulnerable, etc. And at the same time, we are, we are battered by all these experiences, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and pervasive condition suffering. All right. So, and that is true for all sentient beings. I'm just one person. I'm just one person. So if I focus on all sentient beings, the good news is that if I do that, as a side effect, my own suffering will be eliminated. So that's where I'm focusing on, to understand my situation, but right away then think other sentient beings are just like that. So envy becomes really difficult. How can you envy other sentient beings? What do we envy them for? For the suffering of change? for this pervasive condition, what do we envy them for? Whereas if we envy them for their dharmic um, qualities, no, that can only inspire, inspire us. That is done for us if they do this, if they do it, even if they do it for their own liberation, they're still driven by a type of compassion where I am very much the focus on that compassion. So actually their dharmic, their spiritual practices, they're done for me. Okay, so how would I envy them for their dharmic accomplishment? How could I envy them for all their worldly stuff? Because it's just keeping them trapped. So therefore, envy becomes difficult. 
attachment likewise why am i attached to a person who's just as limited as i am myself resentment how can i have resentment they can't help it they can't help it at least i can tell right from wrong possibly a little bit better than they if they do these terrible acts right i mean this is of course all relative but these terrible acts are incredible how can i have resentment towards them okay so instead of reacting with these different afflictive emotions i can instead generate sincere love and compassion for others and that's of course what we're trying to do here we're trying to generate great compassion for other sentient beings this has been your your task this has been your work um, for the last two weeks and we'll continue with this until something else will come up other states of mind you need to practice but basically it is important at the beginning it's important in the middle it's important at the end so hopefully it'll accompany us uh, through our journey well, through this text here all right i've been quite quick here with the explanation i don't think it requires a lot more explanation you can read Lama Tsongkhapa's text. You won't understand everything Lama Tsongkhapa says, but I'm pretty sure you recognize at least those uh, analogies with the wheel. Uh, he talks about attachment and, and so forth. Well, misapprehension of reality and so forth. Misapprehension, I, mine, and then the attachment, all that is mentioned. So you can read through this again. Maybe there's the opportunity to take some questions. All right. Okay, so if you have a question, maybe you have time. Usually there's hardly ever any time. Um, if there are questions, I'll answer those. Otherwise, I'll continue a little bit before we meditate. Okay, go ahead. Um, sure, do, why, do, just you go ahead like we did it before. You just decide. Uh, yeah, if anyone has a question, you can just uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask away. Huh. I wrote a question from last time. Um, we talked about dual cognition. Dual. We didn't talk, mention it. Mm. Can you explain it a little more? Mm. Okay, okay. Non dual cognition should be the word. Non dual cognition. Non dual. Um, yeah, yeah, non dual. So um, this is part of the first verse where the first verse talks about those four great beings, those four Arya beings, saying that they are caught, the causes of these three Arya beings are three states of mind. And of those three states of mind, one is great compassion, and great compassion is also the root of the other two states of mind. Okay, so in that context, there's the non-dual cognition, as it's literally called, and then there is the other mind that is the mind of enlightenment. Okay, mm -hmm. so those are the three causes of a bodhisattva, <coughs> non-dual cognition, bodhicitta, and great compassion. Great compassion, don't need to explain. Bodhicitta here is not bodhicitta, the actual bodhicitta, which is a spontaneous mind. No, it's a contrived mind. It, it's that which precedes bodhicitta, it's before you have a spontaneous wish to become enlightened, you have a one that requires effort, contrived form. And there is non-dual cognition. Now, non-dual cognition is another way of saying a mind under, realizing emptiness. Mind realizing emptiness. Now, we talk about the word non-dual. Non-dual. This is a very... Um, a very famous term that is used also in other spiritual systems. Um, it's used in Buddhism too, but it's used in, in Buddhism is slightly different to the way it's used in other traditions, in some Hindu traditions or some other philosophies. So in Buddhism, the, the word dual, duality, usually has a connotation of like duality in the sense of perceiving inherent existence perceiving an inherently different i for instance i and others a dual dual version of i and others so a non-dual version is saying i and others are merely relative they're merely 
labeled. You are I from your perspective, you are other from my perspective. So there's no actual duality because you're both I and others, because it's just a convention. It's just labeled in relation to yourself, you are I, in relation to myself, you are others. But a dual, if we if 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 there is an if there were inherent existence, then you could not be I and others both. You would be inherently I or inherently other. So inherent I and other, if ex exist, things existed inherently, then there would be there would be long, which is not short, and short that is not long. It would be this dual world where these different aspects could no longer just be relative or conventional. They would be truly this or that. Okay, so either things would always exist or they couldn't exist at all. So this kind of duality here, um, in the sense that we perceive things to exist inherently and therefore we separate I and others. But more specifically, this duality refers very, very precisely, it refers to a perception of inherent existence, right? That's called duality. And we'll talk more about this as we go along, there's, there's, there's a lot more explanation that needs to be given, but a non-dual mind, if duality refers to inherent existence in a more specific way, then non-dual mind is a mind that realizes the lack of inherent existence. Dual, referring to inherent existence, non-dual refers to non-inherent existence, which is another word for saying emptiness. Of course, here we're just mentioning those ideas. We're not, we haven't explained them yet. Those will be explained in the sixth chapter, which is the longest chapter. It's on wisdom, and there'll be a lot of explanation on emptiness. But just for now, in the beginning, it mentions this non-dual cognition. That is one of the causes of a bodhisattva, non-dual cognition, um, which is combined or which is, which is influenced by the type of contrived bodhicitta earlier mentioned. Now, the question is, does every bodhisattva have to have this non-dual cognition? No, actually, no. Here we're talking about a bodhisattva who is more interested, who would, before they generate bodhicitta, they would generate an understanding of emptiness. Because, you can only understand that enlightenment is possible if you understand, if you realize emptiness. If you want to know whether enlightenment is possible or not, you need to realize non-duality. You need to realize emptiness. You need to realize emptiness. And so, and this will be also explained later on why, if you want to, if you want to realize the impossibility of enlightenment, why you need to realize emptiness. We'll talk about this. But the point is here, certain people would say, I will not generate a wish to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings if I don't know whether enlightenment is possible. I rather want to know whether it's possible. And once I know for sure, then I can generate the wish to become enlightened, which you would do when you're bodhisattva. So there's, there's this category of person, which is said to be a person of greater mental capacity as in like greater intelligence. Why are they telling us that? It's not saying we're not intelligent. We are all intelligent with regard to certain aspects, but with regard to this particular aspect, the fact that you're not satisfied with someone telling you enlightenment is possible. No, you want to realize it yourself. And in that process have to realize emptiness. So this is encouraged. It is encouraged because this kind of person, if they have already an understanding of emptiness, it's much easier to generate bodhicitta. Which is why here they talk about this particular bodhisattva to in inspire us. If you want to become a bodhisattva like that, you need to generate great compassion. You need to generate this contrived form of bodhicitta. And having generated this contrived form of bodhicitta, at the same time also have non-dual cognition of emptiness. That's what's mentioned here. Those are the three causes. So sorry, I went into a little bit more of an explanation on this, but it's important. It'll be mentioned again, but you may have forgotten by that time. So to understand the first verse well, 
talks about these three aspects, these three causes of the Arya beings. And then as we come to hear of those three, great compassion is the main cause. All right? Okay, that was a little extensive. We have time for one more question before we start meditating. Yeah. Please. Right. Hello. Yes, uh, I have a, a naive question, if I, so to say. Uh, you made the um, explanation of, um, maybe I come a little bit closer. Yeah. <clears throat> you, you made the explanation of non-dual, uh, non-duality very vivid and, uh, and very clear. And then I wonder uh, if it's if if non-duality is is so easy to grasp, how come we so easily uh, over overlook it? Um, I personally don't think it's easy to grasp. To come to see when if you stick to this this particular, you'll come to see it's actually much harder. I can easily explain it. Um, but it's not that easily understood. And also, actually, well, for us, it's difficult, not so much on an intellectual level, maybe on an intellectual level, it's not that hard, actually. You could also argue if you really get into this, but what's really important to understand is that our mind has these different levels so on an emotional level to understand on an emotional level more on an emotional more instinctive level that things don't exist the way they appear that they appear to exist solidly very concrete this is good this is bad this is right this is wrong and this is my enemy etc they don't exist that way to bring this to a more emotional level that is much harder Okay, it's intellectually, yes, it makes sense, it makes sense, all right. But the moment, how do I notice that I, it's really just on an intellectual level that my anger has not been reduced, my attachment has not been reduced, right? Only when we feel our emotions are starting to change, that's when we get to understand, that, that's where we reached a level where our intellectual understanding has, has now gone to a deeper level where it affects us on the deeper level. So there are many different levels how this understanding can affect us. Okay? And hopefully this becomes clear as we go along. All right, great. What time is it? 15 minutes past. Maybe you have another question. We can have another question. It didn't take long, that long. Oh, I can see now the questions written here. Okay. Um, so yeah, please go ahead if you, if you have a further question, anyone? No question? All right. Okay, great. Now, as before, we'll do the meditation. And what I'll do today as part of the meditation, it's basically, it's verse number three. Um, generating great compassion for other sentient beings by reflecting on the causes that sentient beings have in their mind just go through them to reflect on them become aware of them of course including ourselves but mainly focusing on sentient beings and of course also taking the example of the bucket and rather well talking less about the bucket but about what it refers to um, so in that way again understanding how sentient beings suffer and what i would like you to do um, again just to be prepared we do some breathing meditation I'll ask you to visualize all sentient beings in the space surrounding you. So it becomes a little bit more real for you in the sense that of course they're not surrounding you literally, but there's much more of a relation or so a sense of a connection with other sentient beings, visualizing that. We do the analysis and we end with generating great compassion. Okay, so let's start with a few, few minutes of breathing let go of any disruptive thoughts.
And now visualize that you're surrounded by all sentient beings, all quietly sitting around you. And if you can, visualize that they're all in the form of humans. not in the form of animals or any other form, but they're all surrounding you in the form of human beings, quietly surrounding you. And right in front of you, visualize those people that you don't like. That you resent, that you find annoying, or simply just don't like. And now think that all these limitless sentient beings they're all driven by the same causes. All these ordinary beings have a basic wrong view that mistakenly perceives their I or their self to exist independently, intrinsically or objectively. And likewise, all these limitless sentient beings have a wrong kind of mind that mistakenly perceives not just the I, but that which is mine, my body, my mind, to also exist independently, inherently or objectively. including those people we don't like. They have that same type, type of misapprehension. Which then gives rise to the exaggerating attitude. Due to that misapprehension, they then perceive the I and that which is mine, body and mind, to exist or to be more important 
than the eye and the mind and the body of other beings. And that exaggerating attitude causes attachment to I as well as to my mind, my body. And that attachment then induces the self-centered or self-cherishing type of mind that based on an attachment to I and mine considers my own happiness to be more important than that of others. just as I suffer from that self-centeredness, so do all these limitless sentient beings surrounding me. To think they just can't help their actions because of these states of mind that are the causes for all their activities, for all their actions of body, speech and mind. Due to those, there are now like a bucket in that just as a bucket is tight is tied by a rope to the water wheel of a well, all sentient beings. are tied to the suffering existence by karma and afflictions. Just as the water wheel moves through the force of the person rotating the wheel, likewise sentient beings are totally controlled by their unruly mind.
And just as one turn of the water wheel is immediately followed by another turn of the wheel, likewise, one samsaric rebirth or one samsaric experience is followed immediately by the next. This is true for all these sentient beings surrounding us. And just as the bucket easily falls to the bottom of the well, but is raised only with much exertion, sentient beings easily create the causes for suffering while it requires much effort to create the causes of happiness. Just as when the water wheel rotates quickly, it's difficult to tell when one rotation is complete and another one starts. Likewise, it's hard to tell whether sentient beings experience karmic actions, karmic result, afflictions, and so forth. It's hard to tell which of the 12 links of dependent arising is active at a certain point in time. And lastly, just as the bucket when it's lowered into the well and pulled up again, is better scratched and dented. Likewise, our sentient beings exist within samsara. They experience the suffering of suffering, the suffering of change, and pervasive suffering. So therefore, let's take a moment to generate a deep sense of closeness towards all these sentient beings. They're just like us. sense of affection, sense of closeness, and at the same time, the wish, may they be free from all their different sufferings and from all that keeps them trapped within cyclic existence. And may I be able to bring this about.
try to really feel that from the depth of your heart, with your entire being. And now in conclusion, let's dedicate whatever positive potential we've accumulated here together, having meditated on great compassion. May this become one of the causes for us to attain the fully enlightened state of a Buddha, so that we can accomplish our aspiration to lead all sentient beings towards a state of lasting happiness and contentment. And with this, let's do the dedication prayer before I remind you one more time what to do throughout this week. Don't forget this deep compassion in your heart while you recite the prayer. May all beings everywhere, plagued by sufferings of body and mind, obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the hopeless find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful harvests. May all the medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and the people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. Okay, right. So again, Please, throughout this week, do not let go of this. This is just part of this study to generate great compassion. But again, when you meet other people, remind yourself they're just like me. They're in the same boat. They experience the misapprehensions. They experience attachment. And whatever example you remember, the analogy of the bucket, start in the morning, go through this. It's just it's very simple. Do this meditation and then throughout the day, try to remind yourself of the predicament of sentient beings, which then allow this to be followed by this sense of great compassion, this mind of great compassion. Okay. And again, 20 times if you can do, if you can do more great, well, whatever you can do is wonderful. All right. A little bit past our time. Anyway, have a great week. And see you again next Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you, Geshe-ma. Thank you, Geshe-ma.
Thank you. Good night. Good night. Bye, everyone.